Welcome to the Leadership Conversations podcast. I'm your host, Jono White. I'm the founder and principal consultant of Clarity. We are an Australian-based consultancy that works with leaders around the world, and our passion is to invest in people to become everything they're meant to be in order to fill the world with healthy organizations that people love to work for and customers line up to buy from. The goal of this podcast is to invest in you and your leadership. If you're just joining us for the first time, then feel free to check out consultclarity.org. That's our website, consultclarity.org. We have so many free resources on there. The most popular being our seven questions on leadership series. We've had more than 1,500 leaders from around the world in all different sectors give their in-depth answers on leadership, what books they love, what they found most challenging, uh, the most meaningful stories, how they how they structure their time through the day. That's free, so go and check it out. And we'd love to interview you about your leadership. I believe you have advice from your experience, your context, and your life so far that is important and can help other leaders. It's also a great way to give back. It's free to get involved, and you can do so by going to consultclarity.org forward slash seven dash questions dash interest, or just Google consultclarity.org seven questions interest and fill out the form that pops up. We have a free resource for you on our website. It's called Leadership Survival Guide. It's a 57 page ebook. It has interviews with 10 world class leaders, and you can go to consultclarity.org. It's right at the top and get that today. Uh, we also have a daily email that we send out to over 15,000 leaders, and that email contains the highlights, our best content from our podcasts, our blog, uh, my book, uh, the books that we're loving that are out there about leadership. It's also the best way to get access to our masterclasses and workshops before anyone else. And there's also exclusive and limited uh, special options just for subscribers. And you can subscribe by going to consultclarity.org forward slash subscribe. Now my gift to you is to work incredibly hard to provide the best leadership content I can to invest in you and your leadership. So if you're finding our content helpful, if you find this podcast helpful, then your gift to me uh, could be this. If you, if you do find it helpful, then write a review or rate our content and make sure you subscribe or follow. I can't emphasize enough how helpful that is. It really does help us to get the word out there so we can invest in more leaders to become everything they're meant to be. It also means a lot to me personally when people like you and people in our community share our content on social media. So if you do that, then please do look for me, Jono White, to tag me and look to tag Clarity uh, on whatever platform you're on. And our team, including me, I, I'm always looking to see when people have mentioned us so that I can engage with you. And also we look at sharing content. So if you if you write something about something we've done, there's also a good chance we'll share that with our followers. So if you could do that, that is a massive, massive help as we try to invest in as many leaders as we can around the world. Last of all, you can check out my book about how to deal with difficult people even if you hate conflict. It's called Step Up or Step Out. It's available on Amazon. You can just look up Step Up or Step Out John O'White or you can go to store.consultclarity.org forward slash book and check it out there. I have coached leader after leader after leader and in more than 50% of the sessions, this topic comes up. How do I deal with this person? I'm finding it really difficult and, and I just want to find a way that doesn't blow up to do a really, just to have a difficult conversation, to lead them better. How do I do that? There's a three-step process that I outline in this book that I believe can help you. Okay, let's get into today's episode of the Leadership Conversations podcast. Enjoy. Welcome to another episode of the Leadership Conversations podcast. Today's guest is Dr. Emma Burgess. Emma is the principal of Dane Bank Anglican School for Girls. Welcome to the podcast, Emma. Thank you so much, Donna. It's lovely to be here. Yeah, I'm very much looking forward to hearing your story. Before we get into that, I would love for you to share with our listeners who, you know, some are in Australia, but there's also people all around the world. Uh, tell us a little bit about what you do as principal and also would love for you to share a bit about Dane Bank. 
Oh, thank you for that. Um, so what I do as principal, that's such a good, actually interesting question because a principal's role and my role changes from day to day, from moment to moment, and there's many wonderful things about leading an all-girls school. Uh, I love what I do and I love my job at Dane Bank and I imagine every person that you ask that, Jono, what do you do? If they're a principal, they probably tell you and begin with that they love it and that they're passionate about it and that they're passionate educators and love watching students and supporting and nurturing students to grow. And I think probably in essence, if you wanted to you know, um, simplify what I do and how I see my role at Dane Bank. I see that I'm nurturing and providing the best possible learning environment for our, st our students to become all they were purposed to be and to love learning and to grow and become amazing young women because it's an all girls school. And for my staff and our staff and our team to likewise be nurtured and have every opportunity to be supported to be the best teacher or support staff or member of our wonderful team that they possibly can be. So that's, um, I, I guess, the essence. But then as principal and leading the school, there's all sorts of things that come into that. There's spending time with the girls. There's um, opportunities to go to some amazing events. There's supporting teaching and learning, being part of the learning sometimes. It's oversight of all of that. It's student wellbeing. There's risk. There's all sorts of fun, exciting things like building new buildings and just doing all sorts of things across the school, as I say, to make sure that there's wonderful learning going on. Dane Bank, it's an all-girls yes. school. It's a school uh, in Hurstville in Sydney. I happen to, I suppose, be quite biased in that I think it's the best school in Sydney and the best all-girls <laughs> school that there possibly could be. We're a wonderful community uh, of girls from pre-K, so our four-year-olds all the way up to year 12. Um, in total, I think there's over a thousand girls uh, of, of, you know, from pre-K all the way up to year 12, just over a thousand. Uh, the school actually started with five students. This is a lovely story. Uh, a lady by, by the name of Miss Edith Roseby Ball. She started the school with five students in a little cottage that was actually very nearby where our school currently is, on the back of a veranda uh, in Hurstville, on the avenue. And with five students, she, it grew to nine, and then 20 students, they bought the first little cottage where we are today. And over time, this wonderful school has emerged um, that's passionate, as I say, about teaching and learning and passionate about providing the best possible opportunities for girls. And what Miss Edith Roseby Ball said right at the start was that she wanted to create a fine Christian girls school that would prepare girls for life, a life of service. And in many ways, mm. that actually hasn't changed. We're still a fine Christian girls school. Uh, we're all about preparing girls for life. Uh, that motto for us of Ut Pro Sim, that I might serve, is still very true and lived and breathed today. Uh, we draw on that heritage and we draw on those traditions, but we've also got our feet very firmly in the modern world and we are preparing our girls to thrive and flourish in the modern world um, that in which we live. So it's yeah. a wonderful place and beautiful girls, quite a multicultural community, and I absolutely love it. Jono, when people come to Dane Bank, they tend to stay. So our staff, <laughs> um, you know, it's it's a long, um, I guess a very deeply networked community and, and we all love it here. Wonderful. Well, thank you so much for uh, sharing that. What I, One thing I love that you did there mm. as you unpacked a little bit for us about the school is you told the founding story. Mm. And uh, I, I just wanted to point that out for listeners because I think it's a it's a great uh, tip for casting vision internally and externally, and um, and so I just wanted to point that out to people that if you want to articulate who you are for yourself uh, as a as an organisation, um, but also for other stakeholders, the founding story is always such a rich place to go. Um, and often has the seeds in it that really, when you tell that story, like I just experienced then, as you unpack that story, I go, ah, I really get the, st I, I get a little bit already, not having known much about Dane Bank before chatting with you. Now I know a bit of the core DNA of what you're about, mm. which is very hard to otherwise unpack. Mm. 
Yeah, good point. Mm. So thank you. Already a leadership lesson. Uh, wonderful. Mm -hmm. uh, but um, wonderful to share about the school. Thank you. I, I want to hear about you, Emma, and your journey. So to start, I'd love for you to share, as you look back at your childhood and growing up, what were some of the moments in that season of your life or themes that really shaped you into the person and leader you are today? Mm. Uh, it's, that's such a good question. And, and I think as I sort of cast my mind back um, because, you know, we're talking many decades ago now. <laughs> um, I think formative years for me were surrounded by my grandparents. And my grandparents mm. um, had really strong values and the values were of service and the values were, uh, I guess, of making a difference in the world and uh, using what's in your hand to and, and not just what's in your hand but what you're passionate about and what you're uh, I guess you know you have a, a heart for to actually use that for good in the world. Um, my, my grandfather was a doctor he was a GP down in Wollongong in the days where um, you know, GPs did absolutely everything they were physicians as well as as well as doctors and yeah uh, and it was I guess I, that was a really firm grounding for me um, they did all sorts of things my grandmother did all sorts of things in the community where she started Wollongong Library with some others um, she was the head of the girl guides uh, there was a lot of leadership I guess that I watched and and um, learnt from but it was not so much how to lead but I guess those deep values of service and making a difference in the world so that that would be that would be one formative key thing for me mm. and I think then the next thing for me uh, at school and learning was that I just loved learning and I loved school and I was passionate about education. I actually, when I was talking to the senior school girls this week, I, I was telling them about what career I decided to go into. And I was telling them that at the time I was sort of um, tossing up between law and education. And I think part of the law was because I loved to, a good argument and I um, was good <laughs> at debating and, and you know all of that sort of thing. But but the other side of it, the education was just simply because I was passionate about learning and I, I really loved it. And I did some work experience at the time in some schools and it just, I don't know, it's hard to describe, but it just felt right. And so yeah. I did then go into teaching uh, and and again, I guess those early years of teaching, that was really formative. Again, those, um, as I say, there's the values and that modelling of leadership and making a difference. But then f uh, first years of teaching, I was actually on a scholarship to go out where no one else would go with the Department of Education. And I landed in a country town. And I think when you're in a country town, very, that's a, it's a, an amazing grounding actually for leadership because there are so many opportunities yeah. and you very quickly, you know, my background is in a bit of music and so you're very quickly running musicals and leading teams and so there was a lot <laughs> of experience there um, in all of those coordination things very quickly and very quickly in that grounding. I was doing professional learning about, about how to teach music very early, very early. And I guess I get, it didn't ever, I wouldn't say that it came naturally, but I, I just loved it and enjoyed it. And then I guess you fast forward many years um, mm. and lots of different leadership experiences and grounding in leading teams and what that looks like and so on. And then I did make quite a conscious decision yeah. to do more study so that I could not just be a leader, but actually I could be a good leader and I could mm. learn how to lead really well. So I ended up doing a master's and then a PhD in educational leadership. And I guess, you know, the rest is history there. I certainly, Jono, I didn't have one of those traditional trajectories. You hear mm. of those often where people, um, you know, they do, do a little bit of team leadership and then they're a coordinator and then they're a head of department and then they become a you know, a head of senior school and then a, a deputy and then they become the principal. Mine was quite different. I, yeah. I was a deputy and I was a head of teaching and learning. I was a head of senior school, but I was never a head of department. And actually I had many years in, 
in a, um, studying and doing a PhD. Um, but, you know, all of the different experiences, you draw them together, they become transferable skills, as, as it were, uh, in all of the areas of leadership, so teaching and learning, well-being, um, you know, people management, risk, managing risk, and all of the different things that make up the role of principal, the experiences were there. And, and then, as I say, I'm, I'm here today and absolutely loving it. Yeah, it's, uh, it's wonderful. Thank you so much for, for sharing some of your story. I, I want to ask you about your grandparents. They sound like mm. incredible people and wonderful mm. role models. Mm. Are there any stories from your childhood about them that come to mind with um, anything about service or how you watched them uh, navigate a difficult time or how you saw them, uh, you know, in sort of as a family member, see the passion they had for their work. Any any stories come to mind? I, I think I think one of the one of the things that's really you know um, interesting, I guess, with my grandfather was he was he was an old fashioned doctor, so it wasn't about making money for him. It was about um, you know doing good and and doing it for others and for their their benefit so we would see boxes of um, vegetables and so on on the back doorstep for payment and things like that um, and he would he would you know um, I guess just you know it was it was about looking after people so there so in his leadership and what he did in his practice it was there was a, a sense of nurture and care and I think I've probably taken that in my leadership too you know we can have a strategy and we can be taking people in a direction and have a vision and and then have a plan to get there but it's also very much in schools it's about nurturing people and it's about um, caring for them and it's about having compassion and I guess that emotional intelligence to support people along the way so I, I think that's probably something that I that I took from him I can mm. also think of a, a an example that's actually not an example of my grandparents but when I was a deputy principal I had this incredible principal at the time and she was and still remains to this day a wonderful mentor and role model and I remember that uh, I learned from her what Christian leadership is. And again, I keep coming back to it, it's this heart of service. Mm. We had, we had a, um, a student who was very ill with cancer and um, he was having treatment uh, interstate. And we, we put on this ball uh, and there was a, a fundraising thing and it was just an incredible evening for his care, but actually, what she wanted to do for him, it wasn't just for his care, it was for his university. And so she was sort of giving hope uh, for the future and um, setting him up in that way. It was just incredible. But the thing that struck me um, with this incredible woman was that she she wasn't, um, you know, she was there and she, she stood out the front and welcomed everybody and did that. But then she also got the apron on and went out into the kitchen and served the meals with the students. And mm. I, I, I really, I was quite struck with that, that she, you know, she had that heart to serve, that she was quite willing to muck in and do, you know what I'm saying? Like, you know, it's yeah. the hard tasks and the not so glamorous tasks of leadership as much as, um, being up the front and giving the speech. She was just such an inspiration to me and continues to be to this day. So, you know, a, a vision and a heart to do something, to give hope and a, a sense of future for this student and their family. Yeah. The get up and go to make this incredible event come together. Um, I guess that, that face of the school and the face of um, optimism and um, courage for the whole community but then also the face of service and, yeah, as I say, handing out those meals and serving with the students. And yeah. also this incredible connection with the students uh, where she was beloved and respected and, um, yeah, such, such an inspiration. Mm. Yeah, what an incredible story. Um, yeah. And I, I love that you mentioned how she went into the kitchen um, and served with the students. Uh, mm. It's actually, it's interesting, 
obviously your your passion in the schools um values are, are really uh, aligned around service and for me my biggest learning from this podcast has been how much i already knew this but it's just really been reinforced that great leaders don't see their people as serving them in a very practical sense yeah. Yeah. i think one of the things i reflect on for myself is i wish 15 years ago i had really known that uh, you know when you turn up as a leader to ask the question okay how can i serve my my people how can i support them to get our mission done rather than thinking okay how can my people uh support me or my people are here to support me and i think it's it's not it's often not an intentional uh position but i think that's one of my key revelations from the podcast is to actually see and ask the question, how can I serve and support my people? Mm. Yeah, absolutely. So that's a wonderful, uh, a couple of wonderful stories. Uh, another thing I'd love to know is, when did you first have a leadership opportunity? You know, if, as you look back, when was the first time you reflect that you really had the chance to to run a project or to be a leader in, in some capacity as a young person or to, to manage people. Do you remember what that was? Mm, so I, I think I, I mentioned it. It was that, um, that musical that I did um, very early in my career. And, you know, you say a musical, that doesn't sound like much, but actually there's quite a lot of leadership involved. Um, you know, there's, there's um, casting that that vision I guess of what what you know what what we're going to do what we're going to put on there's developing a number of teams um, for all of the different areas of the musical to pull it off you know there's costumes there's music there's you know the performance there's the actors there's the director there's a there's a whole stack of things it's then pulling together teams of volunteers which is actually in some respects harder to lead than um, people that are being paid uh, so it's it's being motivating uh, and and pulling that off, and then it's of course um, you know dealing with the conflicts that come which which they inevitably do, and it's um, having that timeline and the plan and and bringing it to pass and then that wonderful excitement of of seeing it all come together. It's um, it was no mean feat, particularly as an early career teacher, but such an amazing opportunity and such an opportunity. I think also to learn how to build a team and what, what a team is all about and, and how to, you know, give of the best with that and um, how to bring the best out of, of the people around you. Yeah. It's, <laughs> uh, I love how you unpacked it because I can only imagine how much is involved in, in doing that. It is a, it is a big uh, <laughs> undertaking, particularly for a, 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 a young leader, young, younger teacher. Mm. Uh, what were your biggest leadership lessons from uh, running that musical? Anything that's, that's really stuck with you that you still use today that sort of comes back to a learning you had during that time? Well, I, I can't think of anything specific, I, but, I, but as I say, I think it's about team. And I, I think as a, as a leader, you, it is about leading people and it is about leading team. And, you know, everything we, as a leader, it's about setting a tone, setting a culture, having the right people around you, keeping people not positive, because I think that we can get a, that can be a little bit dangerous when we want to just always be positive all the time but keeping people optimistic. And when challenges, um, you know, inevitably arise, working out, I guess, how to stay, um, you know, you know, it's that above the line behavior. Do you know what I mean? So above the line is, yes. like, well, here's a problem, here's a challenge in front of us. What are we going to do together as a team to solve it? And looking for those solutions together. Um, and, and I guess building that sense of camaraderie and, um, uh, and again, the, just that capacity to deliver on something at the end and the satisfaction that comes with that and the, I guess, that intrinsic motivation. Leading teams, it's, it's actually quite an art. Um, now, that's just fundamental and it's a, a key thing 
that I took away from that time as, um, you know, as I say, as an early career teacher. But as a leader over time, you build on that and you build on not just the capacity to lead a team, but then you start to build on that capacity to lead change. And that's a big thing uh, as, a, as a principal or as any educational leader, that change piece that we all have to lead at this time in, in our world and in our society. Um, it's, it's a new layer and level that we can build upon when you've got that foundation of knowing how to lead a team. So when I say we have to lead it at this time, we know educationally our landscape is such that we are in the modern world and we need to not be replicating um, you know, some things of the past, that, that knowledge and regurgitation only of knowledge and facts and um, just doing exams for exams' sake, uh, th those days are gone. Now, we still need knowledge and we still need deep understanding, but we also need that capacity, as we all know, to think critically, to communicate, to problem solve, to um, be creative and innovative and uh, to, to, I guess, as we've said before, thrive and flourish in the future. And that does require some educational change. It's not only um, uh, that change in terms of those core things that we need uh, for work, but it's also about well-being. And there's a big piece there that we are needing to change and to shift across our schools and also across our society. So there's a big piece as a, a leader, not just to lead teams, but to then lead people in a direction and you know move forward and um, to bring that positive change that people are energised about, uh, a vision that they share and that we've co-created together uh, and something that over time you, you bring to pass. Yeah, that's, um, I, I love that perspective. I feel like uh, leading change in education is, uh, can be quite challenging because education, yeah, from my observation, has been a slower moving mm. um, industry than other, than other mm. industries, say uh, with technology or where, where faster innovation is um, just is part of the industry. Mm. What have you learned about how to lead innovation in education mm. without getting too far ahead of your stakeholders? Mm. Mm. Oh, that's, I mean, we could have another podcast on that one, Jono. That's, um, <laughs> there's, there's so much in, in leading change. Um, you know, an, a number of key things for me is that it takes time. I think sometimes, um, you know, people think that you can just do it very, very quickly, but that's not going to be deep embedded change. So I think we have to always come at uh, a change agenda knowing that it's going to take a long time. I think that staff or people in a community uh, are comforted when, when a leader is aware of that because what we say then is this is where we're going and um, you know the, these are, this is the I guess the agenda that we have but we acknowledge that this is going to take us a long time and we will go slowly and we'll go together and we'll develop together over time to to bring apart uh, you know about that change so number one is time number two is there has to be a reason why um, the first why is why we do what we do and we always have to come back to that now so for us at Dane Bank why we do what we do our big why is our girls and wanting the absolute best for them and as I've said before preparing them to flourish in the future and if we um, come back to that core that's why we're all here it's uh, you know it's it's why we're in a school we're completely passionate about that knowing that we want the absolute best for our girls we need to know that we're preparing them for when they leave our green gates and we we then had to and have to look at uh, if this is our why what is that going to look like so Jono our change journey is taking years you know one of the first things that we did for the first year of this is we actually asked ourselves for a whole year, which sounds a bit extreme, but for a whole year we explored <laughs> what do our girls need? What do they need to be, know and do in the future to flourish? 
you know, we, we looked at research, we had people come in to us, we did a huge consultation across our community, we asked our girls, we asked our staff, we asked our families, old girls. It was a really big, um, I guess, collaborative, consultative process. But it was, in, at its heart, what is the case for change? And uh, we then came to a, a quite a shared vision of that. And um, I guess, you know, in edu speak, it would be what's the student graduate profile. But really, it is for us, what are we going to nurture in our girls um, for their future? And so that, it, that, again, it comes back to the heart and it comes back to the why. And if you can articulate that and if a whole community can understand that, then you can move to the next step. And so, you know, time, it takes time to know your why um, and then know what it is, you know, what's that case for change and make sure that, that we've given that case for change and that we're all on the same page, which of course it's not always going to happen. <laughs> and we know that some people will be completely on board with that, but not all. And that's just, you know, that's the nature of change. But then the next thing is um, working out how and getting a plan for how. And again, this will probably sound quite mad, but um, what we did at Dane Bank is we took a whole year to decide how we were going to implement some of these changes and what was that going to look like. We had committees and we explored things like um, our, our um, you know, release from face-to-face -face time, for example, and providing more opportunities for teachers to collaborate. Um, we looked at our, our learning approach, we looked at well-being, we looked at all sorts of things and came up with that plan of how. And now we start to implement some of the change and um, it's bit by bit and, uh, and we know that we're exploring concepts. The next year we'll start to expand that and over time we know that there will be embedded change. So I, I guess, you know, mm. in summary, it's, it's, uh, it's, it takes time, know your why, make sure we can articulate that case for change and then slowly over time in a really well considered way uh, begin some of those tangible explorations and, um, you know, I guess take risks and and um, do some of the things in the classroom start to embed over time. And look, um, John, I could, as I say, that could be a, a whole podcast <laughs> in and of itself for another day. But yeah. what that looks like for us, we're now starting to, you know, for example, if I take wellbeing, so that's a big um, thing that we've looked at at Dane Bank. So I'll make it tangible so that our listeners or your listeners can actually say, well, well what does that actually look like? So wellbeing was a key part of what we wanted to support and um, nurture in our girls. So we've become a visible wellbeing partner school with um, Professor Lee Waters from the University of Melbourne. And um, we've done all sorts of things. We've got a wellbeing committee where a number of staff members are part of that. And we've got lots of, we've got an implementation team. We've started some different uh, initiatives in our classrooms. We're piloting different things. We have our students, we've, in, we've got a, a wellbeing um, prefect that we've never had before. In assembly, we have some wellbeing activities that happening uh, um, that um, like little highlights, which is really lovely. Uh, we have, we have wellbeing days, we have wellbeing weeks for staff uh, with all sorts of different initiatives. So I guess what I'm saying is over time things start to embed and become, of our, become part of our culture. And then we've been looking at that pedagogy of how we teach wellbeing and um, we've been breaking it down into looking at our strengths and our relationships and coping strategies and so on. And teachers have started to use a number of um, strategies in their lessons to develop that sense of well-being for our girls. So I'm probably rambling. I hope I'm not, Jono, but I'm trying to give, I guess, a bit of a <laughs> tangible example of what that looks like in practice for us. No, it's it's wonderful. I really appreciate you sharing that because it's, you know, leading change is really challenging. Mm. And um, if you want if you want to see change embedded, like you said, you have to be intentional and consistent. Um, I love the book Blue Ocean Strategy yeah, and yeah. 
one of the things I love most in that book is they talk about the three E's of mm. transformation oh. and basically saying if you want to roll out any change, uh, innovative strategic planning is what that book's all about. But oh. it really comes back to they say, well, if you're going to have roll out change, then these three E's are crucial because you need to create a fair process. Yeah. And that's what I love about your process. Um, it, it's I think uh, if you step into the shoes of your stakeholders, your your girls your parents, your teachers, your community. Um, it. What I can hear is that that process would be fair. Like you said, it's not always going to be, people aren't always going to get what they want. But if mm. if the process is fair, mm. then I feel like you, you're so much, you're more likely to, to look around and see that people are still around you uh, and not look mm. around and realize that you've left everyone behind. <laughs> and uh, and the, <laughs> the three E's they talk about is to engage. And so that's why, I th you mentioned this might sound crazy to do that for a year, but mm. I think that's I think that's genius because mm. the engage it's you know if you see the biggest disasters in change management, mm. often look for the red flag where they didn't engage yeah. because that usually and I'm just trying to think of any disasters where that wasn't the case. I can't think of any. I feel like it's always a lack of engagement. And people mm. say, wait a second, this is unfair. I was never consulted about this. What do you mean? What are you talking about? I don't, this is the first I'm hearing of it. Mm. And that word engage, and then they talk about explain and expectations. And mm. I can hear those three E's through your journey. Mm. And um, and that's why I love the year of, en of engagement. I think mm. many organizations could but I'm guessing there's been a cost to that, a cost in time, a cost oh, in money. To absolutely. be that consultative yes. is a sacrifice. Yeah, but, you know, so rich. Um, you know, that, that, that year was, I would say, another E word, extensive, extensive consultation. Mm, um, yeah. there were, I interviewed every staff member one-on-one -on -one for half an hour. So that was 178 staff members, Jono. Um, wow. I went to every class and spoke with all of the girls and got their feedback. We did, um, we had parent forums. It was kind of in the thick of COVID, so a lot of them were via Zoom, but I think I spoke with over 150 parents. Uh, we had uh, things with old girls as well. There were surveys. We got AIS New South Wales to do a school improvement survey. Um, there were all sorts of things that we did along the way to consult and to listen and to hear. And it just, it's so rich because I just asked some really key questions and they mm. were, what do you um, love about Dane Bank? What mm -hmm. brought you here? What keeps you here? What are some of the things that you think that we can do better? And the other thing, of course, that we asked everybody was about our girls. And that it, that was just one simple question of what do our girls need to be, know and do uh, to mm. flourish in the future? And it sounds yeah. um, simplistic, but it's actually quite profound. And it's, a, it's quite a challenging question to ask ourselves, but a very important one. Yeah, I love, I love uh, you know, things that sound simple. I find most of my work with organizations, I go in with a team, mm. we'll spend two days working on the sort of things we're talking about, like mm. where we're trying to consolidate or we're trying to start a process. Mm. And you end up sitting back and going, oh, oh yeah, it's so simple. So I find mm. in these sort of arenas, the more work you do, the more extensive you are, mm. often... <laughs> Yeah. The it seems what you end up with is is so clear. The goal is that it's so clear that it's actually very simple, yeah. um, and so I, I love simple. One thing I was going to say that um, you know that that I wanted to mention is that with these, I think the mistake I've made before, and I see this with a lot of leaders, is we get so caught up on the destination with these yeah. sort of uh, change and transformation projects. And the journey, the journey is part of the destination. I can imagine that year in and of itself mm. would have been such a profound year of change mm. just by doing that process of engagement. Mm. Mm. There would have been your, your alignment in terms of understanding parents and understanding the girls, understanding teachers would have been sharper than ever before. Mm. People would have felt more heard than ever before. Mm. And so it's not just about where you're going. I think when you do a process like that, that journey itself is part of 
um, the destination. Do you know what I mean? Like it's actually yeah. that year, forget where, you, where you're going, which is incredible. Just that year yeah. on its own without any destination yeah. would have been a big win for the community. Yeah, absolutely. And I think an, another part of that is that it's um, not always smooth sailing. And I, I think, you know, sometimes we can uh, hear those um, not simply, uh, not simplistic, but I guess rose-coloured glasses uh, about change. I think we've got to always be honest that sometimes things don't go smoothly and sometimes things don't go well. So I think a good change process too as a leader is actually it's iterative. And by that I mean you, you mm. are constantly, uh, I guess, listening. You're constantly watching. You're um, looking at the tone. You're hearing where people are at. And you, you do need to adjust the sales sometimes. And you do need to maybe slow down. Or you, you need to go, oh, like, be open and honest with, with staff and say, actually, we, you know, we might have missed that here. Or, um, yeah. but this is still our direction and we're still going in this, you know, we're still stepping forward. Uh, and I think that's really important to be able to not have, um, I guess, that ship completely um, sunk, really. You, you, mm. you do need to sometimes adjust those sails, still knowing that you're sailing forward and you're still going to get to your destination, but it's not a simple simple line and it's um, not A plus B plus C. <laughs> you, you, there, <laughs> there is that, there's complexity. And, you know, again, as I said before, we, we're leading people and um, yeah. it's the best of things to lead people, but it can also sometimes be the most challenging because, <laughs> um, you know, because of what that entails. Yeah. Yeah, so good. Well, what I would like to do is uh, I'd love to um, invite you back for another episode down the track, Emma. This has just been so much fun to chat about a change. Maybe next time we can pick a bit of a, a topic, yeah, right. uh, maybe a part two on change. Or like you said, there's yeah. there's so much more we could chat about. I have you know 20 questions that I'm holding back. So <laughs> the invitation's there for a part two down the track, sure. um, which I'd love to do. For now, I'd love to ask you a few questions just to land this episode, uh, Leadership Express. So are you ready for a few questions? Absolutely. Yeah, the first one is, what is a book that you've gifted to other people? Uh, a book that I've gifted to others is a book that was gifted to me. So that's a bit funny, isn't it? But it was um, when I started as a principal, somebody gave me uh, Clarissa Farr's book about leading a school. And it was just mm. a lovely story of, of her journey. It was just in a year what she did from January, or actually it was in England, so it probably wasn't January, but you know, the start of the school year <laughs> to the end. And I've since um, bought a few copies and given that to others because it's just a, it's a lovely, lovely tale, but all sorts of little insights along the way. Yeah, that's a great, uh, a great recommendation. That's, that's wonderful. Thank you. Um, what about right now? Are you in the middle of any books that you're loving or podcasts you're enjoying, blogs you're reading? Uh, this, I, I have lots and lots of things on the go. The one that comes to mind will probably again surprise, but I have um, dug back into my, it's a, funny, there's a bit of a cycle to this podcast, isn't there? To my grandfather, he has yeah. a book of poetry and I, I dug back into that uh, over the weekend and was really inspired actually by the different poems and the the different things that were there so so it's actually a book of poetry um and the poetry it was it's actually printed out it was clearly things that he had had to memorize as a child or you know recite and his favorites and also some that he had written yeah oh that's just um uh, so beautiful thank you for sharing that what is a recent leadership lesson you've learned for the first time or been reminded of? I don't know that this is a recent lesson for the first time. Let me try and think. There's so many every day. <laughs> yeah. um, so many every day. I have a, I have a rule that um, when I ask these sorts of questions, I also occasionally will ask people for their favorite quote. And it's like, it's one of those questions where as soon as you ask it, everything that was there in your mind as you yeah. go to pick one disappears all at once. Yeah. So 
<laughs> I think, look, the thing that, that is in my mind is about, um, it's just it's about setting culture and it's about, um, and, I, and probably what I was talking about before about listening and setting, listening for tone um, because, you know, the leader sets the tone and sets the culture and uh, it all flows through the whole community and I think it's really important that even when we're tired, you know, even when things might be particularly hard, that we're mindful of that and that we continue to live above the line um, by that, you know, that above the line behaviour where we're still that opt optimistic, we're still looking for solutions and we're encouraging yeah. even, you know, despite where we might be and, you know, we might have had a really hard day but, but we maintain and know that we've got that tone to set and that we're wanting to set the best tone that we possibly can for our community. Yeah. Yeah, that's uh, that's so good. Uh, what about a movie or TV show that really impacted you? Could be something serious that uh, is just a favourite because it's, a, you know, really profound or it could be something really light that is a bit of a switching off uh, and, and just you've really enjoyed it. Do you know, one of the ones that I've loved the most, most recently was... Um, Oh gosh, I can't think of it. It's um, Annalise Gregory, I think, in Tasmania, who is a chef, and she's gone to Tasmania to Hugh the Huon Valley. She's got a cottage there. She's done a little series, and in the series, she explores, you know, the animals that she's growing. She explores food from paddock to plate, so to speak. She goes fishing and. It's just lovely, it's light-hearted and links, I guess, to the passion that I have for Tasmania and that area of the world. My eldest daughter is actually currently living in Tasmania and very happy and so that's just a lovely, lovely little series that I've enjoyed. I think it's in SBS at the moment on, um, you know, free to air, yeah. Yeah, wonderful. No, that's, uh, that's such a good... I can't remember the name, um... though, you'd have to Google it. <laughs> yes, Annalise, Annalise Gregory. I think um, we'll be giving you the wrong name. <laughs> <laughs> uh, no, it's 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 wonderful. It's not called Wild. Uh, something to do with being what? I'm just having Girls doing a quick cheeky Google other. while we Girls while we chat. Um. Okay. <laughs> I love I love um, actually um, another one which you might uh, you might really enjoy oh now she has a book called how That's wild it. things are is, is that what it's called the show yeah. as well how wild things are yeah no, the show there you go. Is something else um, uh -huh. <laughs> you found okay that? uh no, that's all I, I keep finding out about her amazing book, supposedly, How Wild Things Are. So um, Annalise yes. Gregory's got a very successful book called How Wild Things Are, but I can't find um, the name of the show. But I'm going to look it up because I love oh, um, girl, cooking shows. I'm sure it. people can. A Girl's Guide yeah. to Hunting, Fishing and Wild Cooking. There you go. Oh, that's such a good title as well. I love it. Yeah. Um, you know, You know what is a great show if you enjoy... <laughs> did you ever did you ever watch everybody loves raymond oh many years ago probably not many years ago. yes yes that yeah. is a good one yes so the the producer phil rosenthal um who basically wrote oh, and produced yes. everybody loves phil i know what you're uh, yeah yeah about. yeah um somebody feed phil have you that's seen it, that somebody feed it. phil yes yes i have that's one of my sister's favorites oh that yeah. is so funny he's, he's um so he's very wholesome and joyous I, I he is him. isn't he yeah, he is he is he's wonderful <laughs> yes that's yes, become that's, one of my favorites Ah, uh, very good. No, the Annalise Gregory one was a recommendation from our Head of Professional Innovation and Practice, Dr. Claire Golich at Dane Bank. She recommended that I dig into that one and, and she was spot on. It was just fantastic. Yeah. Yeah, I'm going to add that to the list because we're looking for something right now. We just finished. <laughs> we just got all up to date with somebody, Feed Phil. And yeah, it is such a joy-filled uh, show. So I'll, I'll check out the uh, Annalise Gregory show. Thank you. Um, last question, Emma. Uh, for today, if you could only give one piece of leadership advice to a young leader, what would you say? Oh, one piece of advice. I think I'd say it's probably it would be one of the most fulfilling, incredible things of your life, 
but sometimes there'll be some challenging days, but it's absolutely worth it. Mm. Yeah, I love that advice. I think, um, you know what that reminds me of? Your advice reminds me of um, the Stockdale paradox in <laughs> Good to Great, yeah. uh, which is one of my favorite concepts, this idea of Jim Stockdale, who went to the Vietnam, who was a Vietnam prisoner of war, horrendous uh, circumstances and when asked you know how did you survive and why other people didn't he talked about what what I feel like you just summed up as well but Mm -hmm. um, that mix of you need to have hope but Mm -hmm. also accept the brutal facts Mm -hmm. and I think that's that should be encouraging for leaders is that if you want to thrive and uh, and flourish as a leader and really make a difference in people's lives, live a life of service, mm-hmm. then find that, accept that there are going to be brutal facts. There's going to be really hard days and really hard seasons, but it is worth it mm-hmm. to persevere as a leader mm-hmm. and uh, and maintain hope. Uh, so, yeah, that's just what that reminded me of. Mm-hmm. What a wonderful, wonderful way to land. Uh, for people who have really enjoyed today, um, I'd be interested to know where, you know, on, on LinkedIn or, or elsewhere, where can they find you and where can they find out about Dane Bank if they're from anywhere in the world, they're just really interested in what you're doing at the school. Well, Dane Bank, you know, we've got a, a website, of course, that actually we're in the middle of refreshing. Uh, we've got an Instagram page, all of the things, you know, the, those handles, Facebook and so on. So it's at, at Dane Bank. Uh, I'm on LinkedIn, so I'm, you know, Dr. Emma Burgess. Um, I'm also uh, on, well, actually, no, it's just LinkedIn. I think you could find me on Twitter as well, which is probably a little bit old fashioned, but, but I'm <laughs> too. No, Twitter's, uh, Twitter's great. It's, um, <laughs> it is, it, I think some of the younger generations in terms of whether they're on Twitter, yes. but when you're, whenever you're in a niche and leadership is a bit like that actually, yeah. but my brother-in-law is very involved in cryptocurrency. Yeah. Um, he works for a crypto uh, bank and is, uh, he talks about all sorts of things that I don't understand and is very knowledgeable, but, um, Twitter supposedly is where there's a lot of crypto, um, right. Yeah. So, so yeah, no, Twitter, it's Twitter <laughs> continues to be a place, but it just, it depends on the niche. So I found leadership's a bit the same. So, mm-hmm. uh, well, I want to thank our listeners today. It's been such a joy from hearing about Emma's, uh, grandfather and just the beautiful, uh, stories there that, that have sort of been woven through the episode, uh, and just such wonderful advice. And uh, don't forget for our listeners, I also have the John O'White leadership podcast and leadership question of the day podcast, two places you can go to invest in your leadership some more. But I want to finish today by saying a, a, a really big thank you to Dr. Emma Burgess for being so generous with your time, for sharing, uh, so vulnerably and, and just sharing those beautiful stories from your family and, and life. And, um, And also the chat we had about change. I think there'll be a lot of people pressing rewind, listening, scribbling down notes because it is hard. And I think you've, uh, you're doing it really well. Um, and, uh, and so thank you so much for sharing all of that. Thanks for coming on the podcast, Emma. Absolute pleasure. Thanks for having me, Jono. Well, I hope you enjoyed that episode of the Leadership Conversations podcast as much as I did. If you're joining us for the first time, don't forget to check out consultclarity.org. That's our website, consultclarity.org. We have so many free resources on there, including our seven questions on leadership series. We've had more than 1,500 leaders from all over the world in all different roles, in different industries, answer these seven questions on leadership and leaders give these in-depth answers around how they spend their time, uh, a book that's been significant for them. It's just a gold mine. It's completely free to access. So go to consultclarity.org and look for that. We'd also love to interview you about your leadership. I believe your experience, your life, your context means that you have advice on leadership that other leaders can learn from. Yes, you, if you're going, not me. Well, no, I really believe you would have something to add. So if you're looking for a way to give back, it's completely free to get involved. And we would love to interview you through the seven questions on leadership. You just go to consultclarity.org forward slash seven dash questions dash interest or Google consultclarity.org seven questions interest and fill out the form and get involved. We have a free resource on our website called the Leadership Survival Guide. It's a 57 page ebook, 10 world-class leaders giving their thoughts on leadership and that's completely free. It's available on our homepage, consultclarity.org right at the top. So make sure you go and get that and download it today. 
And we have a free daily email that you can subscribe to. We send this out to over 15,000 leaders from around the world. And uh, it contains the highlights of content from our podcasts, our blogs, um, our books, books we're reading. It's got the best content and it gives you exclusive, limited, early access to our masterclasses, workshops, new products, special offers. It's all for our subscribers. You can go to consultclarity.org forward slash subscribe and join 15,000 other leaders. And you know, my gift to you is to work really hard, particularly through the Leadership Conversations podcast. I have been blown away by the quality of the leaders and I'm learning as much as anyone in doing these interviews. So I, I'm having a great time. And my gift to you is to keep lining up the best leaders I can to invest in your leadership. Your gift to me, if you're finding this helpful, there is something that you could do that would help us out massively. And that is to write a review and to leave a rating for our podcast or wherever you're watching or listening to this. I can't tell you how much that helps us out. Also subscribe or follow. It really does make a difference in helping us to help more leaders become everything they're meant to be. Another thing that means a lot to me personally is when I see our community share our content. So if you do share this or any other piece of content on social media, then thank you and, and please do that. And look for me, John White or Clarity and tag us in your post. Our team is always looking for posts to engage with from our community. And there's also a chance that we'll share your content uh, to go beyond and share it with our followers. Last of all, you can check out my book. It's called Step Up or Step Out, How to Deal with Difficult People Even If You Hate Conflict. I wrote this book because 50% of the coaching sessions I have with leaders, this topic comes up again and again and again. And it's this idea of how do I have this difficult conversation? How do I lead this person better when I'm finding them difficult? Or in some cases you look and you say, I think I might be leading a difficult person. They're just quite difficult to lead or I'm finding them quite difficult to lead. So there's a three-step process that I unpack in step up or step out. And the amazing thing, and I've literally done this myself and I've heard it anecdotally from other leaders as I've coached them, is that if you follow this process, you will see that person step up and change their behavior or make a decision, which is to step out some of the time. 95% uh, of the time, people will step up or step out in just four weeks. And I stand by that. It's uh, You have to read the book to understand, but uh, I really do believe in it and I've experienced it firsthand. It works. So you can go to Amazon, look up Step Up or Step Out John O. White or store.consultclarity.org forward slash book. Well, thank you so much for listening. We're going to be back with a new episode next time of the Leadership Conversations podcast. And I hope today has helped you to take another step towards becoming the leader you're meant to be. See you next time.